Hi, my name is Heather Roberge, and I'd like to welcome you to our first uh, virtual lecture and conversation of the spring term at UCLA Architecture and Urban Design. Uh, back in the summer of last year, I invited Jennifer Dunlop Fletcher and Tatiana Bilbao to have a conversation about an upcoming show that they were planning um, to hold at SF MoMA, where Jennifer serves as curator of architecture and design, as well as head of the Department of Architecture and Design since 2015. She's been at SF MoMA as a curator since 08, and prior to that was a curator at the Hammer Museum and um, worked on exhibitions at the Getty Research Institute. Um, Tatiana runs Tatiana Bilbao Studio in Mexico City. Her firm began in 2004 with the goal of integrating social values, collaboration, and sensitive design approaches to architectural projects. Prior to forming her firm, she was an advisor in the Ministry of Development and Housing for the government of the Federal District of Mexico City. And um, undoubtedly, this is the place where she began to understand the relationship of policy to housing and policy to architecture. So I invited these two together because I was very interested in hearing about their collaboration around an exhibition at SF MoMA and also um, to kind of model for our very diverse students um, how collaboration across um, curation and um, creative practice works and how audiences and new insights are developed through the format of the exhibition. So I'm really excited to hear um, them uh, introduce us to their working process and to the ideas that they have been discussing in planning for the exhibit at SF MoMA. So I'm going to step back and turn it over to them. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, we are um, super excited to be uh, participating in this way. Of course, we all wish we could be there in person. And um, we do wish, of course, that the exhibition was open. We had to um, stop with one week left in our installation and uh, start sheltering in place. And I was uh, very interested to learn that Tatiana in Mexico City has been sheltering in place actually the same amount of time we have been in California. Um, and it is nice to now get out online and uh, get back to some of our uh, thinking and maybe with a new perspective. I like how Tatiana has uh, titled it, you know, here we are from home talking about domesticity. And um, just to, to start off, um, we wanted to go through a little bit about our, our different uh, trajectories. In particular, um, I think everyone would love to see, um, you know, Tatiana's work and uh, why it was important to me to uh, feature her work and practice at SF MoMA now. And um, I think for both of us, we share an interest in. Um, constantly evolving and not feeling like we've got it all figured out at all times. And it's so nice to meet um, and collaborate with another practitioner, Tatiana, um, who recognizes this and really wants to um, take an opportunity in an exhibition to push something else even further. So the way that we were really um, starting was really to look first at um, Tatiana's practice and then maybe stop and go back and forth a little bit in between and then look a little bit at a trajectory of different exhibitions and hopefully maybe have time to talk about this moment also with the, you all. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm also incredibly grateful, Heather and Tess. It's been fantastic to, that you are able to coordinate these. Um, we were going to be with you personally, but uh, now we are with you virtually. And yes, as Jennifer said, we've been um, in, in 
quarantine uh, quite a long um, while already. It's almost been five weeks. Um, it's been interesting. It's been very challenging. It's learning new ways. I never thought that I had to completely learn any way of doing everything in, in a couple of days. Um, I think we're still struggling. I hope uh, technology helps us today because also this is the first time we're going to share a lecture and a share a, a, a presentation. So I'm also very happy to be able to do this and learn new skills um, in these times. Um, and yes, I, uh, as, as you said, Jennifer, I, I'm always trying to do that to understand what could be the responses I'm trying to think. What can architects really um, do to, to the fact that we could uh, be working for uh, uh, the, the second most important necessity that human beings have in, 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 in life, not to survive. The first one obviously is to be nourished healthy, especially in these moments. But the second one is to have a shelter, a shelter actually that in these times has become even in, more inherently necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, architects, we could be there, but we're not there. I think we forgot um, that that is exactly like the first more basic uh, thing or tasks that we could do and that we can do. And we could work uh, uh, for others, with others, to others, being others to develop that part uh, of their house, of, of their life, no? And um, that has been a very uh, important part of my work. Uh, I would say that we dedicate uh, much more time to think on the domestic sphere than anything else uh, because for me everything starts from that everything starts from that but everything is about it you know I think that when you are able to have your basic necessities covered you're able to become a social human being therefore a part of a community and a part of, uh, of your environment if you don't have that then you struggle with everything every other step and therefore I really relate all my work uh, and I bring it all to the basic unit uh, of the domestic space and um, we've been working in several ways and mostly what I've been trying always which is something I pursue and I will pursue my whole life which is not possible to become is to become that other to design uh, in order to do that, I really try to, first of all, open a very important dialogue with the person that we're building for. Uh, as we did in this house, for example, in Ajijic, uh, Viviana had um, a very uh, large ambition of doing an incredible house, uh, weekend house in, uh, around the lake um, with huge spaces and uh, a big program. Uh, in the first meeting, she was describing that she wanted to have this like really large open kitchen with double hard a high steel, the lake uh, and towards the mountain in behind. Um, and, uh, and when she was going, uh, you know, stepping out the meeting, she said, by the way, I only have $100,000. So it was like around $120,000 more or less. And in my mind, I thought, well, it's impossible. We're not going to be able to do this house. And I was just about to call her. And when I thought, well, if, we, if I tell her that, uh, she's going to go and build the house anyway. She only has that amount of money. She doesn't want to quit her dreams in half. And uh, I'm just not going to do anything. I'm not going to be able to do architecture. So what I, what I decided to do is to work on a solution to, you know, become her and thinking, well, I will not give up my dreams. I don't have any more money. So I would like a house of that, of that size with that amount of money. So we did it and we, we tried to do it. To, to open possibilities in order to search new material possibilities. In this case, we found that the best solution was to use rammed earth. And, um, and in a way to try to become this uh, tool for they, for this family specifically, to be able to have the place they wanted to have and how they wanted to have it, you know. 
And um, we have carried that philosophy always and through all the projects. And that has allowed us to search uh, or mainly to understand many ways of thinking. No, I have understood that there is as in as um, uh, different definitions of domesticities as people in the in the planet, and and with Viviana, I have found even I have uh, uh, understood that it's not also only the, your own definition of domesticity; is that your own domesticity, your own definition of domesticity changes through the course of your life, um, and and in the in it, and also in the in the time or the moment you're living. So we're working now with Viviana to do her, um, like we finished her uh, uh, very uh, recently ago, her, her house, her, her permanent house. And, um, and we work with a completely different client. No? So we realize that. In this case of the house that it's now on view, um, it's a house in, um, in Monterrey. And this house, uh, the clients wanted a, a house that would be uh, really a house uh, in one floor because they wanted a flow, a dynamic flow. It was impossible. This side is a very deep um, mountain hill, a hillside. And what we started to understand is what were those relationships between spaces that were important. We created those spaces to, for them to, to really develop their own way of living, you know? and their own platform on where they could really explore their own possibilities in their own domestic space. Uh, in the same site, but, in, um, but uh, for another person, because it's a, it's a one compound in Monterrey, we did a second house. And this, in this case, was for, uh, for someone that wanted to have, a, again, a retreat house, a weekend house. Uh, in this uh, compound where all his family, where all her family lived, and she wanted really a house that would be able to become this house of the forest, lived, uh, lived for that, lived to the forest, but with not the forest on top. So she wanted like really uh, to have uh, the possibility of relating with nature, but not the nature with her, meaning, and she said it exactly like that, I don't want any mosquito bites in my legs. So what, I, what we wanted to do with this house is to understand how we could break the, the, the domestic space into the, the minimum elements, meaning that we, uh, we're going to build different structures for each of the spaces. And obviously to, to, to go to those other spaces, you would have to uh, do a little procession in the forest. But um, the, in this case, the possibility of exposing yourself to the, that nature, but also retreating you from that nature at some point, even rejecting that nature by the, by the materiality we decided, was the way we interpreted the, 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 her possibility of domesticity. It's incredible how, in this case, um, by really listening and, and allowing her to, to almost like draw in the, in the plans we were doing, involving her in the uh, most basic uh, and more obvious decisions that you would say, well, she doesn't need to know these. She, she really transformed this place into being her own house. And so much that it was uh, very reflective of her, of her uh, at that time uh, interested. And now she has become a nun. So this, and she said that by doing this house and by getting these spaces and by living in these spaces, she decided then to really go there. And I was never really aware of that. I was never even aware of her, um, of her religion religious, uh, um, you know, like kind of um, inclination. And at, at the, but, at, but for sure, the process allowed her to bring her uh, personality there in a way that it, 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 it allowed that to happen. Can and, I inter interject for one second? Um, because what I think is so incredible about this project too is how you were saying, um, you know, really listening to the client and knowing that she was undergoing a very deep personal change, I don't know if it's it's so clear from these images, but these these um, two rooms are uh, really uh, separated, but on the same property. And what I think is so special is 
Um, there's the person, the personal room, the individual space, time to reflect, and then the social space you've made all mirrored and it can go away when uh, the client's not feeling social and doesn't wanna feel like the social rooms are empty either. I think that was really um, very empathetic of uh, what the client was going through and very thoughtful and very creative way of um, dealing Even with it. Even though that I didn't use, no? and, um, and I, I was very surprised very, rec very recently ago how to even understand that the general plan even resembles a monastery. And now she's, she's, she's intending to uh, found one monastery, a women's one at sisters and monastery in Germany, and which I'm working for the men uh, or there. Um, uh, that's an, a side note, but I think that, uh, well, of course, because of Vanessa, but what for me was uh, really interesting that I always believed that I was including her into the, the development of the project. And I realized completely like uh, two years after the house was built that indeed I was, because definitely this is some, I didn't knew her, 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 her process, his, her eternal process. I mean, I, I, we became friends, of course, we had an open conversation, but never so intimate. So I didn't knew this intimate moment, uh, but she was able to, you know, transmit it into the design in a way that it, it was very beautiful. And um, so looking further into that, we, we, we decided to understand how could architecture become that platform for you to build your own space, you know? And not always you have the possibility of having a conversation with, with the person, not, not only in, uh, in individual domestic spaces, in, in one unit houses, but also uh, even more in, or less possible in collective spaces, in collective housing. So how can you then do, create a space that would become that platform for that other to take it over and create its own space? So um, in, in Germany, we were asked to design a house that at the beginning had no client. Now it does, which is very beautiful. But in the moment where we designed it, there was no client. Uh, it's, in, it's in a lake, it's near a lake uh, called Edersee in a very little town called Schied. Um, and uh, and we decided to understand how could we be how can we do a place that it's first of all not defined by program because yeah all we all think we all need a room we all need a kitchen we all need a bathroom well guess what no we don't we not all of us need that probably we have been you know instrumented into think that we need that. But if you look at each other's lives, it's very different how they live. And it's not exactly that we need the bathroom near to, I, of course, we all need a toilet that's a, to satisfy a very important human necessity. And we need a space to cook our meals, but it not necessarily needs to be as it's said, you know, as it's described and as, as it has become almost canonized on how it needs to be. So we decided that if we started with the same operation, we were going to end up with the same um, uh, definition of space. And then we said, well, why don't we start with a different way of uh, understanding space? And this is why we uh, decided to create this um, uh, open chart of possibilities of, uh, of spaces. And we decided that we wanted to think, what are the things we want to promote in this space? Instead of thinking, what are the programs? No? What are the program there? So we wanted to promote six main things. And one is a space that we promote those more intimate individual moments. Another one, a little bit more uh, a space for uh, 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 more intimate congregations of one or more individuals, a space of more, um, of more openness that we could integrate more family members into that um, uh, space. And, and a space that would even open to the community. These six spaces, we collage them, and I'm not gonna go deeply into why we are doing that, but now it's a technique that we're using as a tool even for design. And, um, and we defined uh, like the characteristic, the aesthetic characteristics of those space by, this, by doing these images. Then we had these six uh, collages, and we put them all together and we traced what was that? 
And uh, here we got into a problem because uh, to translate these into architecture became very difficult. And we're still exploring in different projects how can that transformation be a step that will lead us to a completely different definition of, um, of, of a space. Um, right now, we arrived to this um, solution, which probably we would have been able to arrive exactly uh, the same way in, um, in, in another, in, in just the regular process of understanding the, the, set, the program, the square meters you need to build, and we would be ending with the same result. But I think that we are still trying to explore what are those possibilities of creating a space that promotes things by the closeness, by the openness, by the light it posed, by the, by, the, by the height, by the scale, and instead of, uh, of labeling and furniture that it usually is used for those definitions. Um, so domesticity uh, and, and the house, as I said, um, it tackles a deeper basic necessity. So I thought we really wanted to, to, to work on, the, on that and be working and thinking on how to satisfy that uh, necessity, especially in our country that it's very, very high. So, um, because I've been very um, politically open and, uh, and, um, and with even uh, approaching the, the government in terms of the social production of housing uh, and the production of social housing, I, uh, I was approached by a financial institution to create um, uh, an NGO, to create a model for, um, to tackle uh, like the, the, the market of people that build their own houses in the outskirts of cities and in rural spaces. And that is a system that operates in Mexico for uh, since long, and it's called Vivienda Popular. It's a governmental pro program, and uh, there are a lot of organizations who have designed uh, models of houses, and the houses look almost the, the same. They're identical. People can build them anywhere. And then I was invited to do that. And I thought, well, it, for me, it's impossible to think that we are going to do a house that can be built anywhere in the country with, uh, with completely different environments, cultures, et cetera, from one side to the other one, but also to build something that could, that it's so anonymous uh, that really nobody can uh, call it home, you know, it's like, it's going to be home for everybody. It's going to be adapted to home, but how can everyone produce their own one, no? And with, uh, with the guidelines, with uh, formality and with, uh, you know, safety, especially uh, structurally and these things. So we uh, were able to do a modular house that, um, by using different types of materials, depending the module, we are able to build more space in the, since the beginning, because obviously there is a very specific budget, which is building these houses with between 6,000 and 12,000 uh, US dollars. They need to be built with that. Our model, the basic one, is able to be built with 8,000, and then you can increase as, as, you, as you want up to uh, the double of space of what you started. And uh, the idea of this module is that, is that it's adaptable. So every space can be used for different things and every space can be detached from the other or attached to the other, uh, depending if you add a slab, add a wall very easily and uh, also be used in different ways. No? So in the south of the country, you, you normally cook outside, but in the center of the country where the space is so uh, spare and inexpensive, you might use it for also your commercial endeavors. So you need to have a space for selling things or for storing things. And this model, we prototyped it. So we did two prototypes, we tested it, we uh, did a lot of things. Then we were invited to the Chicago Biennial, we presented it there. And then we were asked to build it uh, to like in a rescue situation because there uh, or a relief situation, there was a tornado in Ciudad Acuña in the north of the country, in the border with the US. And this is where we built 23 of these houses. For me, it was very difficult because I'm super against these settlements and these units that are built with identical houses. So the decision of doing our um, model there 
uh, our, our prototype there was very difficult. But I said, well, if my house needs to be adaptable to any situation, it needs to be adaptable even to this situation, although it was not designed for this. So it proved that it gives the double of the amount of space and the, the triple of the flexibility with the same amount of money in even those uh, very strange and difficult conditions. No? So I think that um, not only my interest is in, in understanding how can domesticity be created by your own and how can architecture will be giving you these possibilities, not only for you individually, but also collectively. No? So we've been uh, really uh, uh, studying very much how, um, how uh, social housing and affordable housing can become other thing than just a repetition of boxes in, a, in any given territory. No? Uh, because for me, those could be as simple as just bricks laying down and, uh, and for then a number and not a, a space. So we've been asked to do different experiments and to think very, um, very openly about what are those possibilities? How can a house be fragmented in these spaces and, be, uh, and then become a totally different space by just the aggregation of those on, or how to think collectively in, in this case, inviting other architects to develop different proposals and opening to, to more ways of thinking so different expressions, so there are more offers and possibilities for people to identify with that one or any other uh, giving architecture. And, um, and this exploration has taken us to think uh, that if we can take these into the, into further into the uh, collective space, and this is something that we've been doing in Hunter's Point in San Francisco, and uh, this is part of the exhibition, like this is the central part of the exhibition. And what had we been doing and trying in this project is to understand we could really create this set of, of tools that open more the possibilities for an urban um, uh, neighborhood to be defined. And instead of starting with the same premises of understanding, yeah, the topography, you know, the connection with the rest of the city, can we think more on the types of spaces that we can do and can that allow us to understand how to approach this space differently? We haven't arrived there, but uh, we, because this project is still ongoing, but, to the moment, we don't know, uh, but uh, we are on hold and working towards understanding if this will bring us to create really a space that is open for more possibilities that we don't know. No? So I'm, I'm really um, curious on how architects, we could not completely define our projects, but we could really be uh, serving as a platform uh, or as a, as, a, as a tool for each of the individuals in this planet to develop their own way and possibility, both in the private realm and in the public realm. We have been exploring that through, through, through projects, but also through academia. And, um, and uh, I don't know, Jennifer, if you wanted to, to, I know you wanted to ask something about academia and how the involvement of academia to then go further into the exhibition uh, space. Yeah, I think um, just also, uh, just to be clear that this is um, one very uh, specific aspect of your practice is really focusing on residential projects. I mean, you also do commercial projects and um, educational projects. And what is of interest to me, I'm always looking for um, uh, novel ways to represent architecture because architecture is the thing that you can never bring inside of the museum. You always have to bring a representation of it. And was very um, attracted to the fact that, that you're not just exploring it in built work, but also with the research. And um, through this publication, A House is Not Just a House, um, I got very interested in really looking at your practice from that perspective of something that is extremely research-based, 
that um, you have mentioned that an aspect of why you teach is um, in order for you to keep learning. And um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about that side of um, your practice as it relates to the um, domestic projects. Yeah, in a way, I think that for me, uh, the academia is uh, an extension of, not an extension, I would say even it's, it's just an intrinsic part, important part of my, of my practice. I think they both feed each other and I don't see them separately. I see them, um, as, as you said, as a, as a possibility of, uh, of continue to learn. I think that we can, uh, if I would only be focusing on my practice, um, there's sometimes a, a very easy opportunity to just escape and, and, um, and just go into the train of producing and, uh, and delivering, you know, and not stop and thinking. Um, and I, I always been holding back that train and I'm always trying to, 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 to have that thinking behind regardless. But academia allows me to really, re and reminds me that that is super important in every other project, no? And therefore, what I do is normally like things that we have explored in the office that are of interest, then we open them uh, in, a, in incredible channels through academia. And, um, and I have done like probably almost all our studios have been um, on, on housing uh, in a type of, or uh, maybe I would say even uh, more openly on domesticity. And as I was saying in the beginning from like the, the really more uh, intrinsic part of human being covering spe uh, ne uh, basic necessities. Um, one of the examples is um, uh, the studio I did at uh, GSAP Colombia in the fall 2016 where I was uh, rethinking densification and how could we think on a vertical architecture and how could this become uh, a, a possibility of opening the, opening the thinking of a more organic way of growing to the, to the, to the, to the skies. I believe some, at some point that the city is really banned uh, in, in skyscrapers as it is in suburbia. So for me, these skyscrapers are small uh, pieces of suburbia inserted in the city uh, because they really ban the city. So I was trying to explore how could we bring that to the vertical realm. When I was called exactly at the same time to propose something from the Chicago Biennial to propose a tower. So um, I brought uh, that thinking, even some of the students and, uh, and, and the school, to uh, present this Not Another Tower in the Chicago Biennial, who will, would allow us to uh, explore that. And that we have continuously evolved and developed that thinking, even into built projects that we are, or designed, not yet built, but the, the design of some projects that are on, on progress in the office. No? Or I did this program as well in the two sides of the border, which was uh, an academic program that I coordinated 13 studios in both in Mexico and the US, trying to bring the thinking of how we can uh, really uh, create a, an important space in academia on thinking the relationship of the two countries. I think we have missed a lot um, this. And I think this is uh, a very important matter because the, the border of Mexico and the US is the most uh, closed border in the world. Plus our relationship is really, really important, difficult and interesting, uh, especially in these political times of the moment. So I decided to uh, start this program, hopefully with the hope that uh, there is much more studios uh, looking at uh, problems arise or, or issues arise uh, between, uh, because of the relationship of these two important countries for us. And, um, but I think that uh, that exploration is also taken to the exhibitions, no? And we have uh, um, started to do uh, several uh, very interesting and important exhibitions. It, they start, it, uh, one started at Marco in Monterrey and then went to the Museo Amparo in Puebla, the two very important institutions in Mexico, basically art museums. 
and understanding how we could bring you no know, that architecture what you were saying architecture into the museum um, and we we recently opened an exhibition at the Luciana Museum of Art in Denmark, which has allowed us to explore then how could we bring even our thinking to a completely different context as such as as Denmark uh, to our context. No, how can we bring our landscape and this is why we call it landscape into this beautiful landscape in Denmark, which is the Luciana. But much more, I think that. Uh, uh, and going into the SF MoMA exhibition, uh, for me, it was important to think that we could um, explore the possibility of exhibitions in a different way here uh, with the um, exhibition we did at the Graham Foundation uh, last fall, uh, opening along the Chicago, the last Chicago Biennial, and here called Unraveling Modern Living. What we did is we wanted to really transform the Graham Foundation into a common space. Um, uh, instead of speaking on commons, right now I'm very interested in understanding uh, what is the possibility of, uh, of the relationship between individual unit, domestic unit, and the collective, and how is this step like going to be able to shape that possibility of a common space? And um, and this is why we we decided to speak about the commons. But I thought maybe instead of speaking about the commons, why don't do we create a common in the space? And we opened the space for many possibilities and a lot of things happening. A lot of a, a very interesting things happening are happening, especially for us after that exhibition. We created relationship with people, for example, with Sweetwater Foundation, led by Emmanuel Pratt which um, had led us to allow, uh, to help them think on housing projects, for example, uh, for their foundation. And that has allowed us to expand the conversation uh, in many ways. But I think not only for us, for the house was an opportunity to open to the neighbors. I mean, neighbors came in to the house that never had found anything, any possibility in this house for them. People that really like, for example, these, there was a macro weaving workshop. People that have never entered the, the, the Graham Foundation were really working there and opening other possibilities. But for us was also opening relationships to understanding how we could even impact in other ways. Yeah. Um... Okay, so before we get to our exhibition, I thought I would just go a little bit back in time on uh, the representation of architecture in a micro, micro little um, historical overview, just that the uh, very first exhibitions on architecture were very documentary, images of built work, images, um, models um, displayed like sculpture in the middle of the art gallery, um, and always a built uh, architecture and in a kind of promotional or celebratory way of uh, just bringing note of uh, some, some important movements that were taking place. Um, and then uh, next slide is then mo moving um, 50 years later, looking at um, starting to look at more experiential um, installations. Um, architects thinking about the gallery space as a place where um, you could have a spatial experience and it not being uh, a documentation of something outside the museum, but really how could you bring in a new experience within the gallery. And so from there, um, even looking at the Gordon Mata Clark, I think it's an, a, an extreme example, but a performance even of architecture by shooting out the windows across from the Institute of Urban Studies um, and uh, calling that a performance. Um, this is also then bringing more attention to um, some of the social issues surrounding architecture. And then you start to see the creep in the gallery of using the gallery space as a place for dialogue and provoking conversation with um, what we will call citizens, you know, visitors to the museum, but really trying to engage um, people in a way to maybe be not only more thoughtful about the built environment, but also their role in that. 
Um, also noting with um, practices like Diller and Scapidio, um, thinking about installations, very conceptual installations, rethinking um, the role of architecture and um, you know, at that time in their practice, do you even need to build architecture in order to, maybe, maybe the gallery um, is kind of the end stop where we see like the practice of Levius Woods is really like how to get those ideas out there and seeing the gallery as that space of communication with the most amount of people. Um, and so at SF MoMA, our trajectory has been pretty interesting. Um, there's one slide, I think, before that, where it was uh, from the 1940s. Um, and this was one of the earliest, the museum itself only um, was founded in 1935 and has had a, a string of architecture exhibitions early on, but also ones that were a bit more political in nature, a bit more uh, of asking questions of people coming to the museum of how they would like their um, uh, kind of build uh, city, what, what should cities look like as they were being formed. And uh, with this one particular exhibition led to the formation of the um, uh, Department of Urban Planning in San Francisco. So very pointed um, uh, space that was uh, pretty galvanizing in the moment but did not have a department of architecture and design, not until uh, the late 80s. And what, what is the next slide is, uh, wait, there's, okay, so in our own uh, trajectory of, of stepping off um, where we started having an architecture and design department in the late 80s, and one of the first ones on the West Coast, I think the uh, curators before me were very interested in the role of the gallery space as a place for promoting these conceptual ideas within architecture and urbanism and design. And um, where we, well, I'm just <laughs> going back, sorry, to the previous slide, um, <clears throat> where, where we were starting to see, um, wait, going back one more, sorry, Tatiana. <laughs> Tatiana's driving the slideshow. <laughs> um, uh, where, where there was some interest in, in starting to develop installations and what, um, what we've been taking on and kind of pushing our um, interest in the exhibition. So then the next slide um, is to see how we could be a little bit more interactive, how we can um, yeah, so this is one exhibition where we were allowing people to sit on the furniture and this um, was a, an, an exhibition that included work that was thinking about social hierarchies and an interaction that would be allowed within the architecture and design galleries. And so when we did the Sea Ranch, we also brought in a one-to-one -one scale example of one of the um, apartments at the condominium at the Sea Ranch. And paired it with drawings on the wall. And so looking at different ways of really how to bring um, architecture, but also historical examples of architecture into the gallery space that can be experienced both uh, conceptually and spatially. And uh, with Tatiana's exhibition, I was very, very interested uh, after seeing um, her exhibition in Monterey um, of all the different ways that she represents ideas within uh, her own architectural practice, um, really through drawing, through models, through um, the spatial, I think you saw one of the slides she presented, really how to, you know, kind of climbing through the exhibition. Um, she also had a representation of all the books uh, that have been in the office. And uh, that was very compelling to me in uh, a kind of starting point where we started having a conversation of what, what do we want to bring into um, the SF MoMA exhibition and how do we build it around the local project, the Hunter's Point project? Um, the Hunter's Point project really actually started, it's not just a domestic project, but a project that is really built around uh, a, a, um, a, a real project to redesign with test design the uh, power plant and the, um, the energy st sub substation there. 
which has been a source of um, uh, kind of, uh, not problems, the wrong word, but a, a, a sore spot within the neighborhood. Um, because prior to it being closed down, it was emitting a lot of toxic, um, you know, uh, pollution into the air and contributing to kind of the, the unhealth of the citizens who were having to live there. And it's very interesting to take on this project, I think, for uh, Tatiana coming uh, from, from outside, getting involved in a very local um, issue. And I was very, um, really wanted to bring that in, to bring part of that into the, conver um, the conversation in the exhibition. But also at the same time, knowing about the interest in the residential projects and domestic projects, and also learning that um, she has taken the opportunity to kind of uh, put forward, as she, she already mentioned, um, different possibilities of using parts of the site which are no longer needed for the um, substation because the substation will only take up a third of the site. But how could the rest of the site be envisioned um, to accommodate some of the needed housing or some of the needed community spaces and um, how through the exhibition space or even uh, publication space but in, in our um, case through the exhibition space how could we start to um, galvanize citizens to think through um, something right here in our city that um, should be discussed, should be thought about, should be um, understood a little bit better and um, maybe rally, rally around. But what I like about particularly your representation, Tatiana, and you, you have spoken about this, is that it's important for you that it's a collage because it doesn't mean it's a set design. It's not set yet. It's still a kind of a concept that you're working on and you're inviting uh, input on it and, and discussion around it. And I think that is uh, really important for this exhibition in particular. So what is a stretch for us is, is the, this kind of triad that um, uh, Tatiana has defined as how her practice works with bringing in the political and the environmental and the social, always thinking of those conditions um, <clears throat> is for us just to really take on this local issue in a way that doesn't say this is one way of doing it, this is the only way of doing it, but here are a few ways of doing it because what uh, Tatiana did at the Gram and is going to be doing at SFMOMA is to invite other practitioners, local practitioners, to uh, put forward their ideas as well. And when thinking about the possibility of alternatives to a kind of developer-driven gentrification. And so we are gonna be including some proposals from Niraj Bhatia and Blake Stevenson that you see here to really address the um, lack of uh, transportation that is in Hunter's Point and how to stretch a more pedestrian and um, bikeway into those areas and also from landscape architects Gustafsson Guthrie and Nickel how there's a real divide between um, people who live on the hill and a small business community around the waterfront and where a lot of the focus of the development is but how do you connect the two and I love this kind of idea of um, stretching a kind of pier or walkway or boardwalk right through from the waterfront all the way into the hillside. Um, so these are some of the ideas that we are gonna be pinning up and it's gonna be a little bit more pin up style within the exhibition. Um, I think there's another slide showing the, oh, okay, <clears throat> sorry. I forgot about this one too, that for all of these practitioners, it's really important to engage everyone who lives and works in Hunter's Point and uh, start, have that as a starting point, particularly for now Hunter's Point, um, who's been doing a lot of the community engagement um, activations. Um, then the next slide, I think working with, the, uh, as I mentioned, with the community, getting involved in understanding what is development, what, 
how can they get involved? How should they be getting involved? Um, how, and to kind of empower their voices. Um, what's the oh, next slide? And, and especially I love that Tatiana has designed what we're calling this kind of forum seating in the middle of the exhibition to encourage um, a dialogue with other visitors. Um, there's also a model in the middle, and we may need to rethink this in our um, uh, post-COVID-19 times of uh, social distancing, but it is an interactive model to allow visitors to think about, <clears throat> to be able to play with different um, typologies of like right, building strategies that um, they can see what, how much green space maybe you need, how many um, uh, schools, how many housing um, uh, uh, units are needed. And if you do, you know, 90% of one and only 10% of the other, what does that look like? In a, in a way to really encourage a kind of spatial rethinking. Um, and so the exhibition has this backdrop of where Tatiana has, uh, Tatiana Studio has really been focusing within the, the housing realm and, and also more examples of models as, as a kind of um, trajectory of where her practice has been going. And then on the flip side, this invitation to get really involved in uh, a lot of the issues that uh, her studio has been thinking about, especially as they relate to uh, local conditions. Yeah, so we created this drawing that um, is showing um, a lot of the projects that we have been doing uh, in the office regarding to like, the, it includes many more. So it's, it's drawn um, by hand with pencil in the gallery already. And this drawing has um, models going in and out, like three dimensional parts of it. Uh, so the, the drawing is sectioned and then there's a punch in or a punch out that we call them with part, parts of the building. So you could understand a little bit our proposal, but as Jennifer was saying, the main idea is that this, this is just like kind of the frame where we come from to open this conversation towards uh, the Hunter's Point project and engaging the local public in understanding on what are the possibilities of this place, no? Since we are uh, in a very uh, interesting moment of the project where there's a lot of openness and the possibilities of where it can go, then it's an incredible moment for the museum to allow us to open it to even a broader public, not only the specific community, but also uh, the, the, the whole community that uh, interacts with the museum to really be uh, interacting with the possibilities of this site. And I think that we could uh, only close these, uh, Jennifer, with um, with the, the 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 issue that right now it's an incredible moment to reflect, you know, on the hyper uh, domestic um, situation that we're living right now, and um, and how how important is now to speak on that, you no? Know? How important is now to really speak on it because. Um, we are very privileged and we, uh, in, we in our privileged world are suffering very much on this situation, no? But uh, if you think the stay at home uh, possibility is only for those who have a home. So, um, it's, and especially in my country, this is a very difficult situation right now because not everybody can stay at home, first of all, because uh, they don't have one that it's able to allow them to be there for longer period of time. Uh, but also they don't have the possibility of staying at home because uh, their, their jobs is, uh, they're, they're, like if they don't go out and sell things or do things, they would just not have an income uh, at all no, in, in a situation where you cannot eat at all. So I think it's very uh, important now to start reflecting how we could open those possibilities, no, into uh, possibilities for everybody in the world. Yeah, I think that as you were mentioning, I think we, we feel very fortunate for uh, 
many people it is you you're um kind of in your own sanctuary that you've built but for other people a the domestic situation is really trying and almost feels like a jail cell and um acknowledging that i think there are aspects of your project where um you were pointing to some of the um what we might call kind of cookie cutter um houses that don't really allow for any interaction with your community and it's i think a little bit of um you know family uh kind of personal um relationships aside just the need to be able to have spaces to gather and speak to your neighbors and encourage that the way that i think you were showing us with the acuna project um to build in spaces in between the places to be um you know whether it's through athletics or sports or just putting out uh, dining tables um in a kind of communal space how how we do need that and that's often overlooked within housing projects of um having those communal spaces and um feeling a little bit maybe like we're we're feeling now you know just kind of isolated and as that being um, something to think about as a daily condition and how hard it, that is too. And oh yeah, so these were uh, just some slides that we, you and I uh, put in some from the uh, Essefama collection of, um, you know, the, the, the feeling that we have maybe uh, through some of the works of uh, anxiety or uh, feeling very alone and isolated and then uh, the other work, the Mar Mauro Restife, would be the, the hope that we all have of uh, coming together, especially <laughs> the role that architecture can play in um, gathering people together, whether it's to protest or to come together to celebrate, but um, the role that um, gathering, how important that is in our lives. I think uh, I was thinking a little bit about the students now and how much this moment is really going to define um, your educational experience. I think really for the next four years, I can see how it will will come up in every every class within architecture um, as a touch point uh, from from where to to really consider future um, architecture. Yeah, for sure. I think this is a defining moment and. And a, and, a, and, and, a, and an issue that will uh, shape how we do architecture in the future. And I'm, I'm almost glad to a point. Obviously, I'm very worried and uh, incredibly uh, stressed about the, the understanding that there is not, that this is a moment that is uh, only uh, uh, showing us much more and exposing much more what are the differences, social differences in the world. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I think that it really can become an opportunity to, uh, to, to reduce those and to understand that uh, we need to create a very approach to many issues in order to, to continue be living in this planet and also to transform the way we do architecture for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I recognize we've been uh, speaking for quite a while. Should we s see if there is Q and A? If there's interest in that, um, I would love to open it. <laughs> so we invite the attendees who um, have questions to add them to the Q and A um, uh, area at the bottom of Zoom. And uh, perhaps I could start with a question. Um, I'm sure it's uncertain times, but is the plan to open the show when SF MoMA reopens? Yes, we are really fortunate in that we um, are able to open the um, Tatiana Bilbao Studio exhibition in hopefully in August. Um, and then have it run through January. So we don't really lose the amount of time we intended for the exhibition to be on view. Um, we don't have those dates yet posted, but that is uh, the plan as we, we are intending it so far. And it's, half, uh, it's almost uh, completely mounted. 
it's a very special moment for the exhibition. I, I wonder how, how it is right now there in the empty museum. <laughs> I know, I know, I do too. <laughs> I know it's too bad we couldn't get a walk through here yeah. on Zoom today. Um, I was uh, quite interested in the way in which the space of the museum is understood um, to be a space where you could enact community engagement across different communities, right? Typically, we imagine community engagement is occurring in, in a neighborhood that is um, immediately impacted by a project, but in a city like San Francisco, it makes sense that a, that a large scale development would actually be impacting communities that are both near and somewhat further away. I also thought it was re really interesting the way in which um, cultivating, that the shows you've put together, Tatiana, try to cultivate uh, uh, new communities for the museum itself. And I was really interested in the way in which um, with decisions in programming, for example, and, and even what kinds of um, uh, programming in terms of programmatic content and programming in terms of exhibition formats, you're able to um, produce kinds of engagement within the space of, mu of the museum that we wouldn't associate with the museum, but we might associate with the um, neighborhood community center. Um, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, how you uh, how you manage all that you do. How do you uh, connect with uh, NGOs and um, community activists and your students at institutions and your office? Um, in Mexico, how do you manage to do all of that work and making connections to uh, such a diverse group of participants in your work? Well, first of all, I think that um, it's, uh, it's not only me, and um, in, I forgot to say it in the beginning, I normally explain that. It's like when I speak about we, is it's we are a very big team. No, I probably am the face out there, but the office is um, uh, a very big team that we work very horizontally. And to start with, I include, uh, like, it's not that I include, it's like we are a group and we are a, a, a group working. Uh, we work collectively. The opinions of everybody count as much as my opinion. Obviously, there is a vertical organization for, um, you know, like kind of uh, delivery matters. But uh, but in, in, in terms of ideas and design, it's, it's an open discussion. And this is how we open it towards the rest, you know. And this is how I also uh, do my teaching. I, I believe that uh, uh, everybody has an incredible and interesting opinion and how can we all help to uh, just po uh, uh, potentiate that into, um, uh, in, into better things when we are together and we were, when we are discussing, no? So I think that one of the, the important things for me, and it has been my, my ethos and my way of working, is first of all, listening, no? Listening and be uh, open to listen and to learn from others from others that not only are those others that share your opinions, but also even more from those that have the opposite opinion that you have, no? And, uh, and how can you learn? I mean, like, I remember one example of uh, when we were uh, mounting, so the, the, Ch the Chicago Tower, the Not Another Tower that we presented first in Chicago, and now uh, it will be on view in the SF MoMA, and plus is now part of the collection of the SF MoMA which is really beautiful. Um, that tower uh, was, uh, we, we only did a, a structure and it was completely an exquisite corpse. So we invited the 28 different people and students and these things 
and we gave them just a very general guideline on you have you you can choose any space where you want to interact with the structure with and any program and any any way of doing it and we we didn't knew what everybody was doing we arrived to chicago and all the pieces arrived separately and we needed to mount no and we when we were mounting the mounting team um uh, gabby who's a very been a very long and important collaborator to the office was saying, you know, that you know, this model is kind of ugly. Should we take it out? I'm like, no, exactly that is the point. We include them, all of them. You know, this is exactly the point of this. To who it looks ugly? To, to you? Well, yeah, that's your opinion. But uh, definitely the person that did it, did it um, because they, they intended to be a nice and an important contribution. So obviously that's almost the, the, mo the most important piece of, uh, of, the, of the place, you know, and because of we are trying to include that, this is also how I try to work and how to expand that uh, to other places. Thanks. Thank you, um, Tatiana, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, that was excellent. Um, I am going to be putting questions from um, the attendees in the chat uh, to make it live. So there's a question for you, Tatiana, from Alexandra Lowe. Um, I don't know if you can read that in the, in the chat. Um, Hi, thank you for a wonderful talk with Inspiring images, Tatiana, the work you shared today looks critically at the program as a way to economize and also to cultivate more social interaction and community. I'm curious how these pursuits, when put in action, affect and or innovative in building systems and building codes, for example, the line between conditioned and unconditioned space. I think that um, uh, there, there is definitely a, a, a fact that my work is almost all of it based in Mexico and we have a totally different weather from the US. So the, the definition of condition and unconditioned spaces, uh, for me, it looks more into condition is a space where you have defined things and unconditioned defined how you just leave them open for it, anything to happen. But it, this question might refer to uh, the possibility of having a controlled environment or an open environment. I don't know. Uh, in any case, I believe that um, the, 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 the possibility of uh, in having the specific interaction with both them uh, towards the understanding of the, uh, of the possibilities is the best thing you can do. No? So first of all, I believe that we have come to an extreme of uh, the hyper comfort, comfort to humans. No? So we are trying and pretending to control spaces to take them to the perfect conditions of, uh, of comfort. But what does comfort mean? You know, I believe that we have to become more responsible and aware of the context and think that, uh, that the, the comfort means uh, what surrounds us, you know, relating the best way to the surrounding space. So um, this is why I, I believe that focusing on understanding how can we create those relationships in a better way will help the one or the other, no? I think there are more examples of, for example, in countries in like Switzerland, where you really have to, by code, use natural resources to either warm a space or heat a space. And you cannot use uh, mechanical sources. So uh, I think that we should try to understand how really a natural na uh, na nature circle cycle can help us to build the spaces and therefore create better relationship into those two uh, environments. Should I um, read the other question? Yes, yeah, so I'm actually gonna put it, uh, is that, so I'm gonna read this one out loud because I'm a little challenged here. It says, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. With an explosion in un unemployment and homelessness, how will this shift the focus? Um, 
uh, in terms of ideas about cons the construction of cities. What will the top themes be? Will they be affordability, fast construction? Um, so there's an ar array of ideas here for you to weigh in on, Tatiana. Yeah, well, I think that um, there uh, all the issues need to be really approached. And my my most uh, uh, like the most urgent thing, you know, is the social approach to a towards a new system, uh, political and economical system. I think that will be the real fact and the real change. Uh, um, towards uh, a new construction, no, after these, uh, in any in any sense, and I think then the obviously the spatial definition um, it can be uh, expressed in many um, in many ways, and I think that these will be uh, in terms of looking into a more equal but accepting equal society but accepting its own differences and its own diversity no so i i would say that this is the moment and the urgency uh, that we need to tackle that we have looked for it in the in definitely for the past century but we haven't achieved it and that we are starting to uh, we were starting to look at it in in this moment and right now i think it will be very urgent and necessary. I think there's an aspect too of um, studying um, exactly the responses that have happened in in this urgency, like how quickly um, a lot of these issues that have been kind of languishing are now there's a there's a flame under it, and um, you know a lot of homeless population are being put into hotels really quickly. A lot of these um, uh, quick solutions are finding their um, kind of footing. And I think it's it, that's actually really interesting to be able to study how all these different countries are responding when there is an extreme urgency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think yes. we'll really learn from this um, to be able to know how to move forward too. So, so true. Uh, Tatiana, the last time I saw you was in Mexico City. I came to your office with our good friend, Juana X, and uh, you were showing us around and some students from UCLA a few years ago. Um, and I, I just want to touch on the idea that Heather brought up earlier, which is essentially about um, dialogue, conversation, and it's what, what you do, Jennifer, in terms of opening up um, uh, perspectives, um, bringing people together and, and how you practice, Tatiana. I think um, uh, for, our, yeah, our, for our generation, I'd say the three of us, we were, we were educated by architects who worked for the city, uh, who, who had jobs uh, um, for, for um, to, to, to as, as sort of as civil servants. And as noted in your, in your resume, Tatiana, you uh, you worked for the city. Uh, I think this is probably alien to uh, to the generation of students that we teach now and, and young people that we interact. And I was wondering if you could share some um, um, a little bit of his history about what that meant and what you did. Sorry, can you repeat what that meant? Because it got disconnected for a second. Okay, uh, uh, what working for the city meant? What, what, what did you do? Sorry, yeah, I don't know what happened. It got disconnected for a second. But I think that uh, for me, it's really important first to understand that um, I, I really became to work for the city very naively thinking that the, the the minister of urban planning and housing would really definitely work for the sake of the of the people no? for the sake of society and for the sake of that and that would be for me that was for me the the sole purpose of these places and arriving there and understanding that definitely the last uh, possibility or the last thing they can do is to do it that completely free of anything you know of any ties because when you uh, when you work within the government, there are many many um, uh, issues that have to be taken in account. No political issues, economical issues that not necessarily uh, 
uh, drive you to work for the only benefit of the people, no? Definitely that's the search, but it's not the possibility. And I realized that. I never, I really never thought it was uh, like that. I was very naive. I was 24 also. Right now, I probably would have understood it in other ways, if I was, even if I didn't work there. But for me, that was kind of the, 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 the moment where I understood that for, for in order to act purely, like really in, in, in way more um, uh, direct ways with the people for the people and uh, towards a, 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 a really objective uh, ideals would mm. be in the private sector. You know? So this is when I, I, I went away and started working in my own office. Right. I mean, that, that makes per perfect sense and squares with the way the world has sort of kind of, at least in the developed world, um, how things have unfolded. And yet we see right now, um, to, to Jennifer's point about urgency, I think of the, the kind of urgency that must have been felt 100 years ago, um, let's say in, in the UK where I was educated, um, where uh, not only housing, um, uh, in the kind of modernist sense, uh, was able to unfold in a moment of crisis, but also new, uh, new institutions like health centers and community centers, uh, things that things that defined public urban life in ways that had never been envisaged before. So I'm just wondering if, if, if now, if to to your the title of the of the talk, the subtitle, perspectives from home. Now, as we survey much quieter, much slower cities that 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 do not that that have act, that actually, because of their lack of infrastructural amenity, because of the lack of public expenditure, have sent us back in into our shelters. If there's a way to sort of to to ex will you be expand expanding your thinking beyond the institution of the domestic space? Yes, I think that right now I, I, I'm in this moment of understanding, no? what, is, uh, what is the definition of the domestic space and what are the possibilities of dissecting that, uh, that idea that we have uh, shaped uh, a society. No? And, um, and, and, but also, I mean, I think there is a contradiction right now, no? what happens when you really need to be isolated and by yourself and in a space. No? So, uh, for me right now, I don't know where I'm going to end up thinking after all of this happens and you can see it on this perspective, but also I am truly sure that there is this basic human necessity of having an individual intimate space and then there is this uh, necessity of becoming social and interacting with others uh, in the same in the same balance. So how can we um, understand that from this perspective and at this moment and how can we create spaces for that uh, would be the, the now next question. But I believe that um, uh, that, the, that for many of us, that definition of domesticity will definitely change no? and would definitely uh, be even necessary to do it differently. And on the other hand, what I have seen is that uh, what has also this left us, and I hope it does create an impact, is how uh, unnecessary many things are, you know? and how the basic needs and necessities are really the ones that still remain yeah. very uh, importantly there. You know, it's like we first of all we need to be uh, healthy. Our if you're not healthy, nothing else matters. And then second of all, you really need to have a refugee, a, nef a refugee that allows you to be healthy first mm -hmm. and then to be whatever you need to be, no? Uh, so that refugee needs to be both protective and inspiring. And there is where we are. And I think we should turn around ourselves and work on that. And then the rest might just not uh, be equally there, no? In the city. 
that, that, that Mom, makes sense. I was thinking a little bit about what you were saying about being raised on uh, practitioners who were working in the city. And I was thinking we were probably raised on, um, you know, architecture theory, capital A, capital T was really um, so prominent and really uh, just uh, a real emphasis on ideas and a lot less on putting into practical practice. Sure. And I think what is really coming to fore is, as Tatiana is mentioning, a real return to what are human rights and what are kind of global human rights, not just human rights in one country versus human rights in a different country, but what are the real basics and how do we um, we within the architecture and design fields really rethink applications uh, towards accommodating uh, and, and meeting all those um, basic human rights. That, that makes perfect sense and I was struck by Again, I think of the um, the manifestos of avant-garde practices, um, people like Berthold Lebetkin in London, and, 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 and then 10 years on, 15 years on, Team 10, but ideas of uh, propaganda, direct action, and kind of enacting these things as, as, as policy, and then sort of de de delivering facts. Uh, that's That sense of urgency I, I see in, in in the poster work and in the way that, you know, Tatiana's designed you know, the space for conversation at SF MoMA. Uh, and I, I've just been noticing in, in uh, going to some, uh, some schools, we seem to be in a way teed up for this moment. It seems like a lot of architectural students have, been, have to have this urge to take on systems, really large systems at play. Right. Um, and then other architecture schools are really focusing on the digital and the digital space, which I think right now we're all really experiencing um, in many, many different ways and um, new fabrication strategies too. All, all of that has kind of been teed up, uh, but needed this big uh, kind of calamitous moment to, to kind of bring it together and uh, start to put some of those um, explorations into practice. Totally. But I, I think it's gonna be really exciting within uh, architecture and design in the next few years. Good time to be a student. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I, th I see a couple more questions. If there's uh, time for one more question, Kat, Tess? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, you've probably touched on this but I'm gonna I'm gonna put it up. I think it's a it's a good one to leave uh, leave on Tatiana. I'm gonna put it in the. I think that comes up. Let's see. Well, I'm gonna read it out anyway. It says Tatiana, in this presentation, uh, there is an oscillation in design approach, aesthetic, and methodologies between the initial initial prescribed program, popular housing. They all look very similar. Cookie cutter and your proposal of designing a platform for uniqueness, as well as to engage with various architects to give everyone their own voice. Do you see an intense singularity in design as something that we should strive for? Uh, is, is, uh, is the novel and different more desirable? What are your thoughts on these two polarities of coll collectivity and singularity? Yeah, I think this is a very interesting question, especially because right now I'm really focus and understanding how to include those um, differences in equality. No? So what I was saying that the, the fight of the 20th century was to search for equality and democracy. And that led us to create spaces that uh, right now I see them generic as generic spaces. And, um, and I think that, yes, they created an incredible platform for create more equality and we were looking for that. But I think we left out the possibilities of including everybody, everyone's voice. And that is the singularity. So I think that it's an interesting question which I don't have an answer for. It's how, how can we do uh, create platforms that are really equal for everybody to develop their own specific and different lives? 
Um, and how can we, how can a, a society, we embrace that? And I think that that is very relevant today, no? Because definitely, well, first of all, we haven't achieved the equality <laughs> issue that we were wanted to solve in the 20th century. Um, and the democracy, demo, democratic, democracy issue. And, uh, but right now we face, we're faced with that, no? Okay, we, we search for equality, but we're not equal, no? It's uh, exactly the issue where I always uh, answer when I, I'm asked about genders, no? Uh, yeah, we need to search for equal opportunities from men and women, but we need to understand that we are completely different and how uh, those differences can just embrace and enhance the society uh, in order to, to, to get to better places. So the same, I would say, this is the question right now. How can we do really create, especially in collective housing, spaces that are really giving equal possibilities to all of them, but can embrace the differences that we all live in, you know, because, uh, what we did is we produ mass produce houses that are designed specifically for one type of people, no? which is a family with two kids. No? Mostly all the, the commercial spaces that we live in, the domestic spaces that we live in and that they are built in the whole world are designed for a family that doesn't exist only on the 20% of the world. You know, so how can we how can we open those spaces that are really allowing to other types of possibilities to happen? And yeah, I don't I don't know the answer, but I think that is what we have to look for. Well, thank you so much, both of you, Jennifer, Tatiana, for um, um, spending this time with us uh, on behalf of Heather and the department. Um, it's been a pleasure. And I um, look forward to seeing you in real life soon. Me Thank too. You so much. Thank you, Mohamed. And thank you. Talk to you again. Thank you, Jennifer, for these. And yes, uh, thank you, Tatiana. I look forward to seeing you in San Francisco soon, hopefully. And inviting you all to come see the exhibition this fall in San Francisco. Please keep your eye on the website, and um, we'll, we'll hopefully open soon. Thank you. Will do. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Take care. Bye. Bye.